If you have ever looked into great whites in aquariums, you might be aware that the two don't mix very well. If you want to see what happened to the sharks when people tried, take a look at this video. But basically, the sharks rarely survive for more than a few days as they need a large bodies of open water and prey to hunt. Otherwise, they can become depressed and have feeding and navigation problems. The most successful attempts were done by Monterey Bay Aquarium. Their captures were for research purposes and according to their website, they don't plan on holding great whites again. So, if we would like to see a great white, we need to go to them. Enter cage diving. Submerge underwater and from the safety of a cage, observe the magnificent sharks in the open ocean. All you have to do is, well, gather enough cash to travel to the right spot and enough cash to pay for the experience and you can see these sharks in the wild in a safe and guilt-free environment, right? Well, there might be some problems. Today, we are going to look at some of the concerns people have with cage diving. And to help us navigate this topic, Christian, the shark scientist from the YouTube channel Shark Bites, has kindly agreed to help answer some questions about cage diving. Hi everyone, my name's Chris. I am a shark scientist and creator of the shark YouTube channel Shark Bites, where we look at all things sharky. Big thanks to Wild World for having me on the channel today. I'm really looking forward to getting stuck into the topic of cage diving. Cage diving is a pretty interesting one, and I think it raises some important questions about shark behavior and also the animal welfare of the sharks themselves. But also it has some really profound effects on the tourism for specific countries who maybe don't have that much money. So I really love debating the topic of ecotourism. It was actually the topic of my undergraduate dissertation when I was back at university. So I know a little bit about the subject and I'm looking forward to getting stuck in. All right, let's get into it. So firstly, how did cage diving even become a thing? The first cage dives were done by Jacques Cousteau in the 50s, but the modern version comes from a man named Rodney Fox. Now unfortunately, Rodney Fox was attacked by a great white shark, but fortunately he survived, making him the first person to survive an attack from a great white. The attack occurred on December 8th, 1963, off the coast of Aldinga Beach in Australia. The shark bit into his left side and he needed 462 stitches to close the wound. The encounter understandably scared him, but it also inspired him, and while observing lions in a zoo, he got an idea. Reverse the cage. Instead of a caged animal being around humans, put the human in the cage and enter the animal's domain. He wanted to overcome his fear since the attack, and in 1963, he made a dive with a heavy metal cage. Along with a camera team, he became the first to capture footage of Crate Whites underwater. He helped other documentary filmmakers to take a dive with the sharks, and was even contacted by Steven Spielberg to film footage for Jaws in the 70s. After Jaws, more people wanted to go cage diving, and the phenomenon started to spread. Rodney quit his job as an insurance salesman and devoted his life to the sharks. Rodney was a big advocate for sharks, and helped raise awareness for shark conservation, and he even helped to to make great whites a protected species in the 90s. The tours he started still run today, now run by Rodney's son, Andrew Fox. Of course, more and more companies started to do cage diving, and it saw a boom in popularity in the early 2000s, becoming a popular activity for tourists in places like South Africa, South Australia, and Mexico. It's estimated that in South Africa alone, shark cage diving generates $30 million a year. South Africa became the first country to grant legal protection to the Great Whites in 1991 due to the growing industry of cage diving. So what's the problem? Well, let's look at safety. Believe it or not, some people have died on these expeditions, but not from sharks. In 2008, a boat in South Africa capsized from a freak wave and three people died. This was a rare occurrence, but the fear is that with the growing pressure of tourism, some companies might take risks just to get a better view. Now, regarding the safety with sharks, there have been a few close encounters where the shark has gotten into the cage and risked injury to the diver. And what about the sharks themselves? Getting trapped in the bars of a cage can, and unfortunately has, caused death for white sharks. An infamous video from 2019 shows a shark getting caught in a cage, getting cut up on the bars and eventually dying. More videos online show some sharks getting caught in cages before escaping with an injury. This makes me wonder though, I think in the public Public, we are hopefully starting to realize that sharks generally don't target humans. But why did this great white go at the cage like this? Well, 
Let's ask the expert. Why do you think this great white lunged at the cage? That's a great question. And I think if we slow the video down, we can probably see why. Now, I can't quite tell whether that thing in front of the shark is a bait lure. It looks like it might be, although then again, it could just be a floating buoy or something similar. I'm not 100% sure. But I'd say that it's pretty likely that at some point during this experience, a bait lure was used to draw the sharks closer towards the cages. When bait lures are used, those whites go into predator mode and they're after food. And often when they're in that mode, that's all they can think about. We can see that one of the divers in the cage has an underwater camera. Now that camera is going to be giving off tiny, minute electrical signals, which the shark can pick up. And those electrical signals are very similar to what a dying prey species like a fish might might be emitting. I'm thinking that that shark, which is already in predator mode because of a potential bait law, has detected those minute electrical signals right at the end of its snout and has lunged towards them thinking it's food. And unfortunately, it's got stuck in the cage and died as a result of it. It's very sad that something like this happened to the shark, but it also raises another point about safety. Is any cage really shark proof? In the unlikely event that an even bigger shark, like a big female, really wanted to break through the cage, could she? So sharks are obviously really powerful animals and are capable of causing significant damage to structures. I don't know what all dive cages are made from. Back in the day, it was probably steel, which is very susceptible to rust. But these days, I imagine it's aluminium, which definitely doesn't rust in salt water. So it's unlikely a shark bite is going to do any damage to a cage. But back when they were made of steel, I imagine that a shark thrashing around inside that cage might have caused significant damage to it. These days, though, I think it's pretty unlikely that even a large female would be able to break through a cage from the outside. Now, I don't want to linger on just one video for too long, but I thought I should mention, to be fair, the company running the tour did express a lot of regret and they said they would redesign the cage to prevent any further sharks getting trapped. Is there anything else they and other tour operators can do to prevent something like this happening again? It's tough because I think clearly one of the major reasons this shark has died is because of the gap width between those bars. So it's good to hear that they're redesigning that cage. We can't really see from the video whether a bait lure was being used to draw the sharks closer to the cages, but if it was, that's something I'd recommend cutting out to stop this from happening. In doing so, you're razzing that shark up into predator mode and then drawing it really close to a cage. And there's really not much need to do that. These fish are super inquisitive anyway, so it's likely they'd come fairly close anyway to check the cage out without the use of a bait lure. Speaking of bait, in order to get the sharks to swim up to the boats initially, many, if not most, of the organizations participate in a practice known as chumming. This is where blood and fish oils are thrown into the water to attract the sharks. Due to the sharks having an incredible sense of smell, this method has proven pretty effective. It is a method used by scientists and tour operators, as the logistics of finding sharks can be challenging and expensive. Some have spoken up against the practice, saying it makes the sharks aggressive, causes them to associate humans with food, and brings them closer to the shore, and thus increases the likelihood of an attack. But before we get to the claims of increased attacks, let's backpedal just a little bit and look at some of the effects chumming might have on the sharks. In an article written for the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Mary Bates interviewed Robert Huter, director of the Center for Shark Research at Mota Marine Laboratory in Florida, and they talked about chumming. In one question, Dr. Bates brought up concerns of bringing sharks closer to the shore and associating humans with food. In response, Robert Huter said, Unless chumming is done on a constant and regular basis with a large amount of chum in the same area, chumming will not condition sharks to alter their natural behavior over the long term. When questioned more about if chumming was okay or not, he said it should be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. And that will lead me to my next question. What would be considered good chumming practices, if any? And what would be considered a bad practice? Could chumming potentially alter the behavior of a shark? So chumming obviously varies in terms of the techniques used and in some countries chumming is even illegal. I personally think that good chumming would involve a sustainable fish being used and then that fish being placed in a container that the shark can't get to but still releases the aroma of the dead fish to draw the sharks in. Bad chumming might be using a species of tuna for example that's let's say endangered or then using a bait lure to draw the sharks in and have them follow that bait lure. And then if the shark is able to feed on lots of bits of that chum that is definitely bad. In terms of altering the behavior of the sharks, if that shark is able to feed on the chum or the bait, 
then it's getting a food reward. And if that's happening pretty regularly, then the sharks will show up at a specific time and place to ensure that they get that food reward. They're pretty clever animals. The ideal situation for chum and bait is to use that fish oil slick to draw the sharks in from a distance, but not allow them to get a food reward. As soon as they start getting food rewards, then that's going to be altering the behavior of the sharks. Now I should mention there are regulations in place for cage diving, but with a large number of different operators in different places, not everyone is adhering to the same rules, and this has been exposed on video. There are some conservationists that are concerned about behavior. Andy Korb, for example, is a conservationist who said that sharks get more competitive and aggressive when the boats arrive. He attributes this to the fact that the sharks are essentially being teased by the chumming with without getting any food. He said the bigger problem is great whites becoming more willing to approach other boats. Often people will throw food to the sharks to keep them around for photos, thus enforcing a negative behavior in the sharks. Though to be fair, I'm guessing that most of these cage tour operators will not want tourists throwing food to the sharks and will most likely discourage that behavior. Anyway, despite all his concerns though, Mr. Corb does see a place for cage diving. As he says, I see this as a small potential issue issue compared to the positive impact that cage diving has for the preservation of great whites. I don't believe that there is a direct link between great white bites on people and cage diving, and that's one hot topic that comes up a lot. So let me ask the question, is it possible that cage diving could make sharks come closer to the shore and or make them more likely to attack humans? This one's always been a little bit of a strange one for me. and. I've seen it debated a lot online, but the thing is sharks already come pretty close to shore and in some species of sharks, that's where they're hunting their normal prey. Take great whites, for example, the species most commonly associated with cage diving. These sharks are coming close to shore to hunt seals because that's where the seal colonies are. I don't personally think that cage diving would make it more likely that sharks would attack humans. It just doesn't really add up for me. Yeah, okay, it might make them associate boats with food, which isn't a good thing, but attacking humans closer to shore, I don't think so. There's a whole host of other factors when it comes to negative shark-human interactions, and personally, I don't believe cage diving is playing a role in that. You know, when I first started looking into cage diving and whether or not it was an ethical thing or not, I think one of the first articles I read was really against it. I think maybe it was a Nat Geo article, and it was all about why the author would not recommend cage diving. So when I initially read that, I was kind of against it. But the more I look into it, the more it seems the answer is, it depends. Take another article, for example. There's an interesting article in The Guardian about a cage diving experience. Now, the article is a little dated now. It's from 2006, but it does address some issues head on. The author, Leanne Katz, went on a cage dive in South Africa on a tour operated by Dr. Michael Scholl a famous marine biologist and conservationist from Switzerland. After completing her dive and getting to see a shark, she brought up some of the common concerns, concerns that would later be brought up in a Nat Geo article. And Dr. Scholl defended cage diving. He explained that the sharks were not residents and without a daily encounter, they could not develop a Pavlovian response. Also, while his team does use bait, they do try to make sure they pull it out before the shark can eat it. Though, even if the shark does grab the bait, which they occasionally do, the energy used to get it isn't worth the value of the food. He also explains that to the sharks, the boat, the cage, and the divers are all just one big entity, and that the sharks can't even smell the humans in the wetsuits over all the chum. Despite some notable advocates though, bans have been enacted. Cage diving was made illegal, or at least a bait incentive wasn't allowed in New Zealand due to concerns that would lead to an increase in shark attacks. But the company Shark Experience was able to get the decision overturned and they still operate tours. There was also a ban on shark cage diving in Western Australia back in 2012 that still stands today. Again, hoping to decrease the amount of attacks. The attacks did decrease slightly for three years, but then increased slightly from 2016 onwards with the exception of 2019. Of course, I'm not a data analyst, but I think just from looking at these figures, it's hard to say there's a correlation between cage diving and shark attacks. It doesn't seem to have any effect on the numbers, at least in Western Australia. South Africa has seen an increase in shark attacks since the 2000s. But we also have to consider that there are more people going into the water and that recording data on shark attacks has improved over the years. I think it's important to mention, and I always mention it, and you're probably sick of hearing it, so I'll just say it really quick. You can say it with me if you like. Humans are a greater threat to sharks than sharks are to us. Sharks kill a handful of people every year. 
we kill millions of sharks. I know I keep saying it, but it's important and I feel like I have to say it. Okay, moving on. When Rodney Fox first took a cage dive all those years ago, he gained a new appreciation for the animals, something he wanted to spread to others. Maybe diving with the sharks gives people a new perspective and understanding. Or maybe the people who go on dives were already aware of what sharks were like. Hard to say, I guess. It's also difficult to say if cage diving is effective ecotourism that will protect the species moving forward. For example, South Africa was the first country to legally protect great whites in 1991, probably because of cage diving. But the number of great whites around South Africa seems to be in steep decline. In an interview conducted in June 2021, Sarah Andreotti, a renowned shark expert, spoke about how five years ago she might see 20 great whites in a day, and now she was lucky to see that many in a year. It's hard to say exactly why this is happening. I don't think there's a definitive answer. I know some people think it might be due to overfishing of some of the fish species that the great whites eat but I can't say for certain. The point is, despite cage diving being a multi-million dollar industry, it doesn't seem to be enough to give greater protection to the sharks and their habitat, at least in South Africa. And that leads me to my next question. Given that great whites already have protected status in many of the places that offer cage diving tours, do the tours really offer any benefits to the sharks? In my opinion, Definitely. I'm a big supporter of ecotourism, obviously when it's done in a carefully managed way. For many people, cage diving is a life-changing experience and it sends them away with a newfound awe and respect for these animals. Yes, whites have protection in some places, but the numbers aren't that high, so there's still some work that needs to be done to ensure that we keep this species around for many, many years to come. There's that saying, how can you protect what you don't love? And I think that cage diving can instill a love for these shark species. Now we are getting near the end of the video, but there is one more concern slash question I have. Considering the sharks are expending energy chasing the bait line or simply swimming over to a boat hoping to get food, could cage diving be harmful to a shark by wasting time it needs to feed? 100% this is entirely possible and there is some research being done on this at the moment. It's been shown in some areas where baited ecotourism takes place that some sharks are able to monopolize the bait which means that only one individual is getting that food, which means that lots of other sharks that are coming to the area aren't actually getting an energetic reward from coming to that area. So their time could actually be spent better hunting for prey or resting and conserving that energy for when they actually need it. Well, that adds a little bit of complication to things. So is it ethical? Well, it's hard to have a definitive answer, but I think the main thing is that if you do decide to go cage diving, make sure to do your research beforehand. But what are the things we should look for? What are the red flags to avoid when trying to choose a tour operator? I think doing your research on certain shark tourism operators is really, really important before deciding on which one you go with. So I'd be wanting to find out first, how are they luring the sharks in towards that area? What kind of bait are they using? Like, is it sustainable, etc.? Are they alternating the days in which they bait the water? What steps are they taking to try and reduce the behavioral impacts on the sharks? Are they doing any research alongside the cage dives? Are they contributing to the well being of the sharks from a scientific perspective, or are they just out there to make money? Those are some questions that I'd be asking whoever works for the company before I decided to book with them. Great. And since we are lucky enough to have shark bites here today, I gotta ask, for those who are interested in helping sharks, are there any organizations or charities you recommend? And do you have any tips on what people can do to help sharks? Great question, and there's loads of shark charities that you can follow and support out there. Organizations like the Shark Trust, Shark Guardian, Gills Club, Fin Fighters, Bite Back are all organizations I would recommend contributing something to. But then also doing things in your everyday life, like writing to your government representatives on shark issues when they crop up, or only choosing to eat sustainable seafood. That's if you eat seafood at all. These are all little things that do add up and help sharks in the long run. Thanks again so much to Shark Bites for being here today. If people are interested in seeing more of your content, where should they go? Firstly, big thanks to Wild World for having me on the channel today. If you're not subscribed to his channel, you definitely should. He's got some awesome content on here and I'm sure he's got some great videos coming out in the near future. Then if you want to find me, please do come and find Shark Bites on YouTube. I'm sure Wild World is gonna put all the relevant links in the video description. If you like Shark, Shark Bites really is the place to be on YouTube. We've got hours and hours of content ranging from movie commentaries to creature features, reaction videos. There is literally something for everyone on Shark Bites. So yeah, please do come across and subscribe to Shark Bites. I'd love to have you on the channel and it'd be great to have a chat with some of you in the comment section of my videos sometime soon.
And you know, I just want to add to that a little bit. When it comes to shark videos online, or shark articles or whatever, it seems that the ones that promote sensationalism and bad shark science tend to claim the spotlight. But if you want to hear some real shark science from an actual expert, then you owe it to yourself to check out Shark Bites. I mean, Christian already mentioned, but this guy really does it all. Shark movies, shark games, viral shark videos, shark facts. He even debunks Megalodon Still Alive videos. Whenever the media is ready to jump on some half-baked shark nonsense. He's there to give you the truth in a fun and entertaining way. If you have any interest in sharks at all, you really, really should subscribe to his channel. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Hope you have a great day.